And welcome to the second lecture in our Black Atlantic speaker series, one of four different series of talks that we've been running this year. I'm delighted to see so many people, but not at all surprised. There is something magical about seeing Ghanaians take on the world. Tonight's lecture by Ibrahim Mahama, the author and the artist, not the chairman of engineers and planners, I should add, <laughs> comes at a very significant moment, one which has been centuries in the making and the other which is barely a week old. Some of you in the audience may wonder why we chose to present Ibrahim's work in this category and not in any of the others, the Pan-African Speaker Series or Case Study Talks. And to answer that, and by way of one kind of introduction to Ibrahim Mahama, I would like to try and situate his work in two very powerful trajectories. The first being the Black Atlantic, an interpretation of cultural identity that goes beyond the nation state, beyond national, ethnic, linguistic, or even racial definitions, to produce a different dimension of belonging, not to a specific place or location alone, but to events, particularly those on a global or historical scale. The other trajectory that is relevant to Ibrahim Mahama is more immediate and poignant. 72 hours ago, the world was shocked to hear of the passing of Virgil Abloh, a Ghanaian-American visionary whose creative legacy is now only beginning to unfold. And I mention this to highlight something that all three of them share, which is multiplicity. The ability to be two or three things simultaneously and harmoniously, which is not to say that it is easy or without friction. But they all show that it is not only possible to be both an artist and an architect, a fashion designer and a DJ, a painter and an activist, it is desirable and increasingly necessary. More and more, these are the very qualities that enable us to navigate an increasingly complex world. Stuart Hall, the Jamaican cultural theorist, reminds us so powerfully that the world is now full of people who belong to more than one world, speak more than one language, inhabit more than one identity, and have more than one home. The ability to confidently slide between and across categories that often seem more impenetrable than national borders is one of the great creative hallmarks of the Black Atlantic and the African diaspora, indeed of all of us who live, breathe, and speak, in inverted commas, more than one culture. Born in 1987, and I'm never sure whether mentioning a man's age is the right thing to do, but there you go. <laughs> Ibrahim Mahama obtained both his BA and his MA in Fine Arts from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi. He was the youngest artist featured in the, Ghanaian, in the Ghana Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2019, but was also part of the 2015 Biennale, curated by the late, great Okwi Enwenzo. He is described as a painter, author, artist, and sculptor, and was named one of the most hundred most influential Africans in 2020. I read a piece in the New York Times this morning by the journalist Doreen Senfeli, who said that for the polymath, a person of multiple talents, there is always a cardinal subject, a chief preoccupation around which all the other interests spin. The South African critic Sean O'Toole describes Mahama's cardinal interest as labor and collective enterprise, displaying, in his words, an audacious sense of materiality. In preparing my introduction earlier this morning, I read a conversation between Ibrahim and Sharon Obubwe, published in NKA Journal of Contemporary African Art a couple of years ago, where he describes his interests in exploring how images are constructed and how space is perceived. He uses his training as a painter, which I would argue is his cardinal subject, to explore issues of commodity, migration, globalization, and economic exchange. His large-scale installations occupy a third territory, hovering somewhere between surface and space, and his works are as likely to involve a team of people as they are the solitary artist. He mines our urban environments for found objects and materials, which he stitches and sews together to form coverings. Architectural metaphors abound in his work, 
but it would be a mistake to try and read his work solely through the lens of architecture. His ideas and tools go far beyond it. What is important, I think, to understand is that the intense dialogue that Ibrahim creates between two or more disciplines that draw on architecture also draw it out. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted and honored to introduce Ibrahim Mahama. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Leslie, for first and foremost the, yeah, I was very delighted when you wrote me that email several months ago. Um, yesterday I was, uh, I was telling her a funny story that I was on a flight to Zurich, um, no, from Zurich actually to Athens, and I was afraid that I wouldn't make my flight back to come to Ghana to this. So the, as the bag was just about going on the conveyor belt, I grabbed it and I was like, I'm not going anymore. <laughs> And here I am today. So, um, yeah, thank you all very much for coming. Um, it's, um, I know it's always difficult to get out, particularly at this time, but uh, I'm glad that we can be able to have at least some kind of a conversation around the thoughts and ideas I've been working with the last few years. Um, where do I start from? I'm mostly a bit incoherent when it comes to, because I'll be going back and forth in between things, but please bear with me. Let me start so I know the time. Yeah, so um, as Leslie rightfully described, I studied painting at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumase between 2006 and 2010. At the time, uh, our program was based on the old British curriculum, so it was quite very conservative. Uh, painters were meant to make like paintings, sculptors were meant to make like sculptures and all that. There was never really a point where even like between the architecture school and the art school, there was always this distinction. There was this divide in between. It's only recently that um, the curriculum has somehow been revised. So artists who, yeah, who are painters or sculptors or working in ceramics or anything can actually think of their work maybe in a more of an architectural context, not in the sense of an artist producing work to fit within, let's say, an architectural space, but thinking about his work in the context of, let's say, architecture in itself. Um, that's one of it. The second thing is that when we were students, one of the things that we were very much focused on, also through like uh, our mentor, uh, Karikacha Seidu in Kumasi, was also to really rethink about art in itself. What is art really? Because for a long time, we never really asked that question, because artists would take inspiration from the market or subject matter, and then they would make a painting out of it. And the painting would end up in a hotel, yeah. So there was something called art, like that thing probably is the canvas that you would hang in a museum or in a hotel space. In our case, most of the exhibitions would have happened in hotel spaces, you know. So the question was how do we go back to art itself and how do we deconstruct art? Um, for us, one of the strategies was to look back in time and secondly, also look back at the society, like look at like, um, if you go to the railways and like town, the market spaces and all that, there is so much, like in terms of the manifestation of form, there is so much that happens within these spaces that can inspire us to really think about the reconfiguration of art and what it can present to us. Um, so I start with these two images of the, this is an old image from the 1960s of a worker in a paint factory in Tema. It was one of the old Gehok factories. And that one is an image that I took of the workers at the railways in Sekandi. It was uh, one of the largest uh, railway spaces that was built by the British back in the late 19th century. Uh, over time, of course, the workers there have somehow evolved various labor methods and like they've really evolved it into like different intellectual labor forms which they use in fixing some of the trains that are still in existence today. So as an artist, I've basically just been interested in these labor forms and what they present, like not just as images, but also with regards to the physical and material conditions of those uh, spaces. Um, this is in Greece, in, um, in the Syntagma Square, where most of the protests happen. And uh, this is in uh, an old fertilizer factory also in Greece. In uh, the early part of the 20th century, when the Ottoman Empire occupied some of the islands in Greece, a lot, there was a huge migration to Athens and other parts where there were different uh, factories, spaces that were created in order to inhabit these migrants. 
of course, I did a, <clears throat> an intervention in, as part of Documenta in 2017, actually. And part of the interventions was actually taking these cocoa sacks that I've used widely in my work, taking it to St. Tagma Square, where normally protests would happen, and occupying the square with this act of labor. So trying to draw a connection between the act of labor within a space where protest happens versus an abandoned old factory which is de uh, decaying. So for me, the element of decay and also how it's combined with labor is very important in terms of how we think about economic and architectural structures. And here I try to make a, a comparison between some of the buildings, Bauhaus buildings that were built back in the early 20th century versus um, this is um, mold um, at uh, the railways in Second D, where the workers would uh, make, they, they make these wooden uh, bricks and then they would cast them in iron and then they would use it to replace the old trains which they don't produce the parts anymore. So I'm really interested in it. One, as an architectural structure in terms of uh, the design and secondly also in terms of um, yeah, form, like in terms of what it does, like if you're looking at it just formally in relation to, let's say, architecture. Um, so here, yeah, I'll spend just one minute. So as an artist, one of the questions, the big questions has always been about art, in terms of what art is. So here, I try to make a small sketch. Uh, I hope it's not very bad. This is, uh, <laughs> so this is, I start from here. So this is, uh, what's the name? At one of the silos that was built by Kwame Nkrumah. So the silos were built actually concrete brutalist structures to contain cocoa beans that we, that Ghana at the time for economic independence, whatever. It was never realized because in 66 when Nkrumah was overthrown, a lot of these buildings were abandoned. So now we have to import, the Ghana Cocoa Board has to import new cocoa sacks in order to carry the beans and, try and send them to Europe, Switzerland and other places. And then when that happens, it generates a lot of like, excess capital through foreign markets, and that money comes in the form of NGO, support aids, things like that. And then when the bag is no longer, it can only be used once, it's no longer needed, they send it, uh, they sell it to the middlemen in warehouses, and then they then now will sell it to market women and others, and they'll use it to transport all kinds of commodities. Uh, maybe sometimes the artist might buy some of these things, and then he'll swap it with, for instance, uh, old sacks, which have been used to a point where it has, it's almost like a corpse. So at that point, it's stained. No, nothing can ever happen to it again. But at that point, the artist thinks that, oh, maybe it's interesting because at the point when the objects seem to have died, that's when it's actually living more than it was before. So now we combine it with labor, like with uh, kayas, like all kinds of people, like uh, that's uh, Max will call the lumping proletariat. And then we create a, f a new phenomenon in terms of a new energy because now the ghosts which are in the material which has accumulated pr produces new forms of life. And then we produce something... Yeah, that's why I say something called art. Something that is called art. And then now, this thing that has been produced, which has gone into the world market, in terms of the capital that is created, the capital is far more valuable than what was produced when the sack contained the beans. So it means that now, the intellectual labor and the histories and everything which I was talking about, now makes the object even more special than it was before. So you are now you're not going to consume the bean, but you're going to consume the being in terms of like the life form and the philosophical aspects and the architectural forms, everything. And then the capital goes back, but when it's going back, later you would see SCCA, red clay, the old Russian cemetery, like kilns, blah, blah, blah. And then a part of the money goes back in time to the silo. So now the silo, which has been abandoned to rot, we can use that capital from the dead material to buy it again and then now we can bring the silo back, and then now the silo can become, let's say, a new functioning body or space. But then how do you explain the fact that something which was not meant to be um, has actually come back, yeah, has somehow manifested in a certain life form and has been able to produce, let's say, different forms of phenomenon that allows for us to deal with infrastructure, ideas, archives, artworks, Paintings, sculptures, installations, sound, archaeological materials, technological forms, and agriculture. So at the end of the day, 
it's almost as if we're somehow redistributing capital, cultural forms, and like new values and all that. Because the thing that we called art before, after all now, it's not just the only art form. Because we've been able to repatriate the capital and gone back into time, it's almost as if we've time traveled. Now it has allowed for new forms of institutions to emerge, which allows us to create new forms of art. And that's where my interest is in. So I will go a bit further. So the silo, this is an example, one example of it in the Volta region. So if you were to, the silo was not meant for human beings. So you cannot, it's literally impossible to be inside. But you can make an architectural intervention by cutting into the concrete. So if you cut into the concrete, it means that human beings will then now occupy these kind of single, religious, almost religious spaces. You can take it apart, break it down. Even when, if the silo were to fall down intact, you would, the top part, some of the top parts which are exposed with all the iron rods and concrete, even aesthetically, it presents you a very different visual form in terms of how you look at it. So I have been thinking about this uh, kind of uh, building this art school, independent art school in Tamale as part of the, as part of the work that I'm doing. Uh, and I, the Savannah Art College, like thinking about how the, the failed space, like the idea of failure in terms of the architectural form can somehow embody new forms of like intellectual discourse in a way. Yeah, so these are examples of like some of the things I'm thinking about, like how we can reoccupy these spaces by just a simple gesture of cutting into, let's say, a part of a building. It allows us to be able to confront history in a very different way. Um, yeah, so it brings me down to the looking at the relationship between, let's say, the history of the Ghana Railways, workers, labor unions, and what it produced back in the time and looking at it in relation to, let's say, work that we are doing in our generation with regards to, uh, so that's a, a character called Assemblyman, like uh, Arketica in Tamale at Red Clay. And um, through conversations that we've had over the years, he's come to somehow sympathize with arts in a certain way. So he's able to, when we have children at the institution, he's able to use language as a way in order to communicate ideas regarding these artworks. And that's a work by an artist, uh, Icelandic artist, Olaf Eliasson. So I'm really very much interested in how now the, yeah, the, the, the ordinary, like if you go to museums in Europe, the security man has his place. He's there to make sure that you don't touch anything. But um, here he is like, he is the, he is the epicenter. Like uh, his role is not just to to direct people, but his role is somehow to be like a, like a contributor within the space. In terms of the thing called art, the phenomenon which has now taken place, it doesn't really reduce individuals to certain specific roles, but it gives them a wide range of possibilities in terms of how they can also be, like they also intervene within spaces. Um, so this is the bottom, one of the bottoms of the silo. Uh, photograph that I took back during the pandemic last year. So the one in Tamale actually, when it was abandoned, like all the other ones during the structural adjustment program, they were all sold. But the one in Tamale was never touched. So I was lucky last year to have bought it when they were selling it because the idea was to demolish the building. But then I said to them, why don't we turn it into some kind of a cultural institution? It could also just be a memory bank or something. Because for a long time, the building had been named Nkroma Volene. And in our language, the volini means like inside a hole. It's like a black hole, like you don't go there. If they say we put you in a volini, it means like you're finished, you know. And the volini is interesting because um, when you take it as a word, it's, it has a negative connotation. But when you break it down, it means to transform, to teleport, to magically disappear, to like... There's an element of potential around the deconstruction of the word. So I always thought it was quite interesting because the building which had been abandoned because uh, after Nkrumah's overthrow, they had, there was a propaganda that he was building these spaces as uh, military detention centers for his political opponents. So for almost 60 years, we, Ghana as a country, we never dealt with these buildings. So you go all around the country and we have these huge carcasses just sitting all around. And I asked myself, 60 years, why haven't we engaged with these things, even from an architectural point of view? Like, even if they were 
military detention centers. At least we could transform them into other things because there is a huge wealth of like knowledge, like even just in terms of looking at just the aesthetical aspects of these spaces, not even going into like the philosophical aspect. So we found a huge colony of bats in the building because was, the building was submerged in water. So after pumping out the water, we realized that there was a huge like colony of bats. So the, that was at a time when the pandemic was like really hard and like thousands of people were dying every day. And everyone said, oh, the bats are killing us. But then again, human beings have been the greatest catastrophe on the planet. So then again, what do you do? Do you really get rid of the bats? So I said, no, let's keep the bats and then let them be cohabitants of the space. At least if another generation, children who are coming to, who inherit this space will understand the idea of cohabitation in terms of looking at what it means. Because the void, the, we couldn't go into the building for 60 years and that only allowed for the ecosystem to form. So it's rather a shame to get rid of it. It's almost as if we would have somehow sliced history in a way. Sorry. So we did a lot of work around the building, like excavating. My father is a civil engineer. He's very, very supportive. So renting these are very expensive. So he has a lot of them. So he just gives this to us to. <laughs> so it's, um, it, comes, uh, it comes in a bit handy when your family likes you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of artists who dare not even think about it. But, um, so it's interesting how that began, that we were thinking. So that's why um, the idea of painting now is not just reduced to the artist. Because in, the, in an earlier form, the artist would have made a painting of the building and whatever there was in it. But this time around, the artist has to insert himself within the crisis. Because crisis is now the basis. Because we do understand that like, we are all... The, the conditions that we face is a similar conditions that all kinds of people or species face around the world. So we really have to be able to insert ourselves in, this, in these forms if we want to make like a significant change. Yeah, even like plastering, painting it with like waterproof materials. And do, so this was during the dry season, a uh, raining season, just to protect the building as we were using it for an exhibition. And then in the dry season, we came back to it again, re-excavated the whole building, and then now built like a thick layer of like concrete, waterproof concrete all around the building in order to permanently protect it. So it's always, always like you're going back and forth in order just to be able to. And honestly, this is not the work that we should have been doing in our generation. Yeah, like it's almost as if we are paying for the sins of our, the older generation. Yeah, honestly, because um, we could have been doing other things. But we have to do this work because it's almost as if we are the last frontier. If we are not able to do this kind of work, there would literally be nothing left actually for the generations who are yet to emerge. So a lot of things like materials, decaying, like blocks, I'm very sensitive to materials and how we use them. So even in terms of when we took the building, how to, the walls that we had to build within it, the extra walls, I wanted materials, blocks that were almost decaying. I know a lot of people around, they buy blocks to build their homes, but they leave the blocks for so long, so sometimes it develops mold over time and it gets dark and all that. So I went around selecting these specific uh, blocks and then we make new blocks for them and take the old blocks. And then we use those blocks to construct. So when you come to the silo today, you see some of the walls, you think that they've been there forever, but it's because of the specific... Um, and then there's something important here. So the construction, the casting of the concrete, and also like uh, when we have, because most of the program that we do as part of the institution and the practice is also involving another kind of generation, like children from high school, like primary, for them to witness this idea of the archeological excavation. What does it really mean for us to be able to like put ourselves within these positions? So they are not just spectators coming into the museum to see, but they also have to witness the birth or the excavation or the resurrection. There is something very poetic about it. Um, so not just the workers within the space, but uh, I know that in, uh, in architecture when construction is happening, uh, the people are not allowed there for safety and things like that. But when philosophy and other things are involved, uh, <laughs> it's rather a risk not to let them be there because that is what we need in order to build new ideas. So. Here, 
we have um, a lot of people like comrades, people that I've worked with in time. So that's my uncle, Isa, who's been very instrumental helping us logistics, moving things here and there, airplanes and all kinds of strange objects. That's my dear colleague, Salam Kuji, who is um, artistic director of the institution in Tamale. Uh, studied with him since undergrad. So like in terms of like finding people that's at wavelength in terms of thinking, it's very important. Uh, these are students, people, uh, professors from the university who we've worked with producing different kinds of exhibitions in Tamale, and uh, our future um, uh, audience. I, I, each time, I, I know each time I uh, listen to architecture talks, I always hear that the word clients, and I'm always very confused because for me, I don't have any clients. Maybe the clients are the children who are going to grow up one day and who didn't commission you to do the work that you're doing. But knowing that one day it will have a, some kind of an effect in the way that they are placed within society is very important. Um, I also have uh, my dear colleague Francis and Isnam here, but they are very shy. So, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of people, like in terms of looking at how we can be able to build these things. So now, the silo, of course, the kind of interventions I've done over the years have varied. So sometimes, literally, covering the building, and this was part of the Exchange Exchanger in 2015. Yeah, the silo in Tema. So it's the same silo that I'm thinking about re-intervening within now. And um, looking at these same thing, and this time around, not thinking about intervening, but let's say, rethinking about the architectural form and what it can do in relation to like t uh, technology and like ideas of exploration and things like that. And then here, you have examples of the building again with like l subtle architectural interventions of how it can be experienced. And then in Tamale, instead of building on top of the building, just converting it into a greenhouse with the same excavated soil from the building um, that somehow feeds the ecosystem within the, within the space. So looking at ecosystems and ways in which we can combine, let's say, mechanical forms like the trains from the railways and excavating the inside and then converting them into like a, um, Aquariums and all kinds of spaces within the within the silo. So most yeah, so mostly exploring ideas. And there are a lot of people in the area, like people who lives have been connected to these spaces, who either go there to smoke or just wander about in spaces like that. And when I bought the building last year, the young men and women in the community were very excited. So I worked with a lot of people actually to in order to be able to excavate and to bring this building back to life. So at the end of the day, it's the most important thing is about the ordinary gesture that brings these things back to life. So that's what I was talking about, the redistribution of capital and also like uh, ideas. Um, so this is within the building. And one might think that it's a Galamsey site or something, but it's um, our own history, 60 years of void that we are somehow bringing back to life and making for... Uh, creating new possibilities. Because what happened was that the building was, the municipality had poured tons of sand into the building to conceal it because no one wanted to deal with the building. So we had to excavate all this building over several months with a bucket in order to get access to it because of the way it was designed. Because literally you couldn't get into the building without, you had to use a shovel and a bucket. And it took a long time to do that kind of work. Yeah, so whilst we're excavating the building with a shovel every day, and we're also building the Parliament of Ghosts, which you'll see. The idea is to think about the two like timelines, because this is a building from the 60s, which is lost in time. And then we are trying to excavate it in order to be able to produce new futures. But this is a space that we are somehow excavating the floor, just to be able to build a space that somehow uh, is going to be significant of the time that we live in, in terms of looking at artistic forms and gestures, things like that. Yeah. So this is a build, one of the images of the building when the, with the sand, and then now that we have like a 3,000-year-old Egyptian coffin in it, where we can engage children together with the bats and everything. And there's a Sputnik here, the first satellite that was launched into orbit, so you wouldn't see it, but it's there. So now that we've excavated all of this, there's a huge element of potential now. 
in terms of ideas and new things are born. So uh, just this idea that we've been able to intervene within architecture in very different forms gives us a whole new, a whole new audience in terms of a new future. Yeah. So inside we have artworks that are projectors and things, but very sensitive to the bats. So the, the areas, the bats are in one area. We do interventions in one area, things like that. So and these things change. Yeah. Yeah. And suddenly the thing that no one was supposed to go to, we have like all these new audience people, like children who are going to grow up with it with a different set of ideas. So the, all the 60 years, my father w was a teenager when these buildings were being built as a civil engineer. He never engaged with them. And suddenly, after many years, he, he's found a reason to intervene within that. Imagine all those years, all those ideas, and now we have a, new, a whole new generation who are going to um, bear different, uh, different kinds of ideas out of the same, the same space. Yeah, so, yeah, so it basically it's almost like a, it's a work in progress, but I like the idea that we are able to insert ourselves within that uh, and we're able to share that with, uh, with our audience. Yeah, so this is a photo of um, the railways in Sekendi with the trains and then uh, SCCA in Tamale during the construction process. And I was very much inspired by the railways also at the time in terms of looking at like the architectural forms because at the time when these buildings were being built, even the first modern art museum in the world was not constructed yet. And the trains, really massive objects which were occupying these space. But when you came into Ghanaian art history in terms of looking at art, there were very tiny things, like people just made paintings and then it's almost as if, if you couldn't make a painting which was bigger than the door that you were taking the painting through, you couldn't make painting. So that was one of the questions that I asked myself. How do we even allow for like the silo going back in time into spaces like this and just looking at the sheer scale, some of the spaces were quite rid ridiculous in terms of the size of the objects, in terms of how it could inspire us to even think about building studios that could allow artists to think about new types of ideas and new types of works in a way. So the excavation process brings us to the work of Mr. Kofi Dawson, who is an artist that passed away like two and a half months ago. May he so rest in peace. So he was an artist that I had a conversation with uh, in 2015. And I was convinced at the time that it was important to convert my studio, which is now SCCA, into like an institution. Because at the time I was building it just as a studio space. And all this research I had done over the years, I wasn't really sure whether it was I wasn't sure the direction that I was going in, but having a conversation with him was so clear at the time. So we decided to hold a retrospective of his work. So in turn, like digging into the silo, we had to work with young artists, intellectuals, in order to dig into his life's work, uh, revisit his studio, uh, uh, paint works that he wanted to paint for a long time that he couldn't, um, complete certain works, restore works, restore his studio, so it took almost four years in order to make it happen, but eventually we opened an exhibition of his in uh, the space in Tamale, where uh, for the first time we were able to bring together 60 years of his life's work under one roof. Um, a year later, we did a, another retrospective by another Ghanaian artist, Ajimano Se. So the first one was curated by Bernard Quay Jackson. Um, the walls and everything were built by students, students actually from the university, like this one in terms of looking at the labor forms and all that. Um, so these are students and also the curators, the director, Selom Kuji. Like, so for us, in this timeline, we are like workers and we are laborers. We are here to work and we are here to ensure that at least we are able to create a new image of, let's say, what it means to be able to produce some kind of a, a new cultural identity, at least for ourselves. Because for a long time, it's almost seemed as if people take yeah, people are very chill, like, oh, let some people do their work and then we watch. I'm like, no, we all have to do the work if we really want to build like this new notion of what it means to occupy this space. So I, for me, the work that we do is it's a, it's, it's, it's a constant state of, it's in a constant state of crisis, yeah. Because everything that I've done till now has been from making 
something called art and using the capital in order to organize all these phenomena. So it's really important how we're able to go back and forth in between time in terms of looking at even the, the, year, the, the, the years that it took in order to be able to build these kinds of um, things. So this is a, a top view of some of these. Yeah. So com like uh, modern art. So I'm talking about, so sometimes people think I hate painting. I don't. I'm actually, I love painting. <laughs> I love painting, actually. So if, in order, to, if we are not able to crack the infrastructural aspect, we are not going to be able to at least do anything that is going to be significant that would somehow leap us beyond this timeline. So now that we're able to like, uh, go into that aspect, we're able to at least create exhibitions that bring together all kinds of forms that at least can allow for a different generation, to, a different point of access into what is called art. Yeah. And the art takes different forms, Selom with Asinam uh, and Sakite working on workshops in the center with school kids. Mr. Dawson working with the kids on producing the brushes that he would use for his painting as an artist. Um, and all kinds of things. And this is one of the few times that it brings together different generations. So Dawson, may he so rest in peace, he died two and a half months ago. So it means that if we hadn't done this exhibition, his whole life, like many other artists, would have been lost in time. And it happened in this country, like the silos, for so long, and we have to excavate. But it's very important that at least we're able to at least do these kinds of uh, excavations within this, within this period that we find ourselves in. Yeah, that's the work of Tracy Thompson, um, which she uses um, food, like wache, and she cooks it, pours it on like a canvas, and as it dries up, it begins to crack with all these uh, fungus, algae, and others. And it's really interesting how that works with, let's say, photographs. It's part of uh, an exhibition that we did with a, a Danish institution, Aarhus. Yeah, so how it's the, also the organization of the thinking around what it means to be able to produce um, art. So the, 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 the institution becomes a, some kind of a laboratory. So Tracy is able to cook. It's almost like a, we're going back to the lab. Whereas in the museum in Denmark, she wanted to cook there, and they said, no, you cannot cook because of the regulations of the... Yeah, but now, because we've been through all this archaeological process and everything, we know that we can now... The museum is not a sacred place. Yeah, so now we can cook in the museum. The museum is a living space. <laughs> it's living as any other space is living, you know. So, um, so, uh, so at least the students can believe in uh, art in a different way. And that's uh, Ben Saibu, who is uh, very much interested in archaeological forms that we've been having conversations with. And uh, we were able to like, um, bring he and Dawson together, two diff like people in the same generation across different times, never met, and bringing them together in order to have a conversation at least about cultural identity and things like that. Um, so um, going back to the archaeological um, material, so I took these photographs in York at the Railway Archives in England, um, looking at like archives of like how some of these vessels were transported to Ghana for colonial exploitation and using that spirit in order to be able to produce these phenomenons of like Ibrahim like in the, the mouth of the excavator like um, yeah basically like you know these kinds of things that you think ordinary people like these are the people who are helping us to be able to restore these kinds of spaces and we'd always at the end of the day when we're thinking about capital there's always some kind of a, a dichotomy between let's say how it's like what it translates into and the labor that goes into it. And uh, yeah, so the truck mates, um, truck drivers, engineers, people that we work with in order to be able to at least bring that spirit of collaboration back together again, in order to be able to do like almost impossible things, like transporting airplanes six, uh, 700 kilometers to Tamale by road, it seems, sheer stupidity, who would do that? Because at the end of the day, it's non-profit. Like, because everyone was saying, oh, but are you going to open like uh, the annex of uh, the, 
the restaurant in Tamale, and <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's almost as if Ghana sometimes, once we see something, it limits the way we think forever. So it's very important that we're able to like, it's like a boom, like, yes, let's try something else. So I, I remember, yeah, flying a drone and like filming, photographing these transportation process in different landscapes, Kumasi, all around to Tamale. Images that probably you would have never seen before because even satellite images could not capture this kind of um, uh, creating new kinds of uh, events. Yeah, so I remember there was one at the airport and we had to transport it by land, and oh my God. We were trying to get uh, permission from the, the VRA because of illegal electric connections on the road and they wouldn't do it. And my uncle, uh, he said, the one I showed because for he's a true believer. He's one of those people that you need in your life. When you say you want to do, when you, you want to do something and you yourself at some point, you're like, this thing, it will not work. And it's like, it will work. <laughs> so very interesting. So it's like, it will work. So we worked, worked, worked. And one day, the, the guy said, no, we'll not give you the permit. And then we just got the thing on the road. And, and someone called them, like, hey, the people, they did it, you know. So they just... <laughs> <laughs> Very Ghanaian. They turn off the lights. <laughs> of course, we got a, back, a huge backlash for it in Tamale, but that's, we needed this kind of art in terms of thinking to uh, manifest. Yeah, so you see it on the road, almost like a whale on the... So in relation to the landscape, it doesn't seem to make any sense. But then again, art, we're trying to open up the discourse in terms of art. Um, and what it can do for us. And I remember that day, the, all the kids were really surprised because probably they will never see this image again. It's like waking up, like all those American films with the aliens, like waking up one day and seeing aliens outside your house or something like that. Yeah, it was very shocking. But I like the idea that we're able to create those shocks because we need that shock in this generation. Um, now, the, the airplanes, the images, that in terms of looking at it in relation to the landscape where the shared trees and everything are, it becomes part of the landscape, so you're not able to distinguish between. And then now that we, as Walter Benjamin has put, in order to be able to change anything, we need to change uh, own the means of production. Now the means of production allows us to be able to explore certain forms of thinking, which in a different generation, it would have been impossible to arrive at. Uh, now we can be able to excavate as we did in the silo and then teach drone technology, creating new forms of singularity. So now, what has the drones got to do with all these old airplanes, which CO2s and others? But at least now, if it's acting as a classroom, the event horizon in terms of like the point of thinking is now going to be very different in terms of how we embody, um, how we embody this um, this, the community that we find ourselves uh, within. So that is um, red clay. Um, it started off with just a small part section, and as I became more ambitious, we, this was the first expansion, and then we built this extension, and then the parliament came, and then we built this other extension for cinema and then library, photography, and then we built this residential space, which is still in progress. This is like a year ago image. And then we brought the airplanes for classrooms and other forms, intellectual forms, and then thinking about future expansions. So the idea is not just building spaces that act as archival, pedagogical forms, but also to be able to, the gift, uh, which I didn't talk about in the beginning, that art begins as an idea of a gift, given something that you don't expect anything in return. So now the artist practice, in terms of looking at like all these works that I've made, uh, over the years, which are like in major museums around the world, which if you think about it, most major African artists, like no one here ever sees their work anyway, because the West, like the problem I was talking about in the beginning, all these things have ended up in the West because all the excess capital is in the West anyway. So now, when, as the artist is also thinking about the intervention within the infrastructure, the work in themselves are very important because the children who are growing up need to be able to experience these artworks in this context the same way as it would be in New York, in London, or any other place in the world. I think if we're talking about freedom and justice, that is what it's truly about, that at the end of the day, we do believe that fundamentally we all share the same values and we don't have to 
look otherwise. Um, so these are some of the collages and drawings also which I've done. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a capital corpses um, from the last show I did in London with these old sewing machines and classroom cabinets. Yeah, so if you're, because in the last couple of few years, I've gifted almost all the works that I've done to the institution, so it's a lot. If you're thinking about it in the next century, that's a wealth of material. Yeah, and then we don't really think about it when we're looking at like all these Western foundations, Andy Warhol, whatever, but it's very important in terms of how we think about uh, preserving the kind of work that we do at least for a different kind of legacy. Yeah, this was in Sydney. Yeah, so that's Essinam there with Selom. So the studio can function in many different ways, um, exhibitions, workshops, um, so in as much as we are thinking about the, now that we've established the fact that building the spaces as an art form can also allow for different kinds of art forms to exist within. So though I'm thinking of it as an art form, but still we're able to come back to the idea of painting, yeah, in a different context. So Eric Jemphy's work, photography, we thought about in a different way in terms of looking at the negative on a glass plate and then having like our young audience to be able to at least uh, bring in Sakite. Um, I studied large format photography in Berlin. So bringing the camera and then being able to connect to the idea of like light and what it means in order to be able to create images and all that in the midst of Eric's work is very important. Um, yeah, so archives from the railways, like paintings, Charlotte Hagan's painting from the 60s. Uh, that we got on loan from the National Museum here in Accra. Um, some of the drawings and collages I've made of the silo and using that to connect to like this young generation. So suddenly it's not as if the, the painting or the drawing is hanging on a wall. So now even that it's occupying, let's say, the form of like a, a, a drawer, like what does it mean in relation to other forms of archives and experience? That is also very important in terms of how we look at the material. Um, yeah. So this is at Red Clay, and this is in a school. So how we're able also to be able to go back and forth in between different spaces is very important um, in terms of the work that we're trying to do. So this Selom and I, where we're using like the archival gelatine, silver gelatine prints from the railways in order to be able to convey meaning around like the materials that we've collected from the railways parts, like old decaying parts and all that. So cabinets from 130 years ago when the railways was built, which would have been demolished that we've saved. So every single thing is very important in terms of what it means. So now when you're having a conversation around, let's say, memory, the objects even themselves play a very important role in terms of what they do um, to us. Um, so now we go to the parliament. So in the parliament, the idea of excavating the ground, as we saw in the earlier image, of the, to be able to create a new space through that labor, uh, using like drawings that I made combined with like engineering drawings from Manchester, which was the work was originally conceived for, and building, let's say, excavating the ground to be able to build this space, Parliament of Ghosts, which was uh, the idea of using the residues from the railways and everything to build like a space that would allow us to go back and forth in between time in terms of like memory. Um, and the parliament in Manchester was a building, a museum space where the artist has built the artwork and it can be taken away. And, but in the case of Tamale, it is built permanently. It's part of the landscape. So except if the world came to an end, it's not going anywhere. And that is where I think that when we are talking about, let's say, uh, yeah, the, the subjects around repatriation and things like that is very important for us to come back to this idea or this notion of building things that somehow, if not in, not in Accra or Kumasi or anywhere, but even just the idea of, because if you really want to test freedom, take it to the place that you know that it doesn't exist even to begin with. And then if it works, then we know that, yes, maybe we're indeed, there's something called freedom, but not when it seems to be a bit comfortable in a way. Um, 
Yeah, so I like this idea of going back and forth because I document significantly in terms of the processes of my work and thoughts. So the parliament, in the first time we opened with a retrospective of Ajimano Say, uh, in relation to like the moment when we had to cast the first concrete in order to be able to get the form of the, the parliament. And these are some of the ideas of things. So as you're building the space as an artwork, you're also thinking about artworks in terms of singular objects and things in relation to the space. And this is a recent, yeah, maybe a two weeks ago image, where I'm also interested in how, like as the space is developing through the labor forms as it was in the silo, we can be able to have like these school kids who are witnesses actually to these architectural forms and interventions. So the art, it's almost as if you are building an architectural form, but the architectural form is both physical and ideological because they just witnessing these different art forms and having intellectual conversations with them at a point, it registers different things in their minds. And I think it's one of the things that has been missing within the, after the 70s. I think that there was a serious uh, intellectual decline. And some of these things are very important. Um, if we really need to like make new headway. So these are just images of the parliament. We use a lot of the water from the rain since we hadn't roofed in order to be able to build. So even just the, the design of the space allows us to be able to collect water for the construction process. Um, yeah, so these were some of the things I was talking about. Yeah. So not separating that, I'm looking at just material and what it does. And I remember one of the times, the kids, one of, you know how Ghanaians can be very annoying, like when you're building this, and then everyone that came to the space said that, oh, are you building a swimming pool? And I said, no, <laughs> I'm not building a swimming pool. And one day it rained really heavily, and it collected so much water. When we came, the kids were swimming in it. And I was like, you know, <laughs> they were very right. Maybe we're indeed building a swimming pool. We just didn't think about it. So that gave new forms of ideas, in a way. Um, and also just the way the space is used in terms of the, this kind of intervention within the space, in terms of a construction site that presents different forms of like engagement. Um, so this is uh, the space now. And then um, going back to like the classroom, looking at like uh, what these architectural like, um, and artistic gestures mean to the space. And now we have, let's say, a different kind of intellectuals, like kids in the community who are engaging with like technology and other things through this simple, singular idea of expanding the thoughts of painting and like cultural forms in a very different way. Um, and um, these are the last few images, so just bear with me a bit. So this is. Um, um, What's the name? A swimming pool, actually, in Bogatanga. So it brings me back to the swimming pool. Yeah, so the swimming pool, we, for a long time, we're thinking, I, I was thinking about it just around the time we, were, uh, we had done these water lilies uh, as part of the exhibition in Tamale. And then someone told us about this old abandoned swimming pool in Bogatanga. So we went to see it, and it was really magical. Like, uh, places where goats playing around, kids, like everything, like the fishes, snakes, just like the silo was. So the idea was that, oh, is it possible for us to be able to at least intervene within this space, finish it, like it protect the ecosystem, like remodel the pool, and then be able to create, let's say, a new kind of, let's say, uh, intellectual space that is based on just the simple idea of like, let's say, a swimming pool or something like that. Yeah, so going back to the idea of like digging back in time. Um, I'll talk about this later. Yeah, so digging, going back to like classroom textbooks. I collect a lot of different things. Um, uh, burying like tanks in the floor of these like new architectural spaces, uh, suspending airplanes within like a classroom, new forms of classroom spaces. Uh, having, let's say, observatories at the top. So the idea is almost as if, like this, going back to this idea of like, if we were to cut the earth and see all the different forms of like soil uh, formations and things like that. So back to the railways uh, image of the bricks and the mold again. 
So now we can go back to that and bring it back to this idea of creating spaces that are born out of decay. So you have, let's say, the Bogatanga swimming pool, which as a space, an architectural space, is very promising. Because how do you occupy or engage with a space which is pro uh, supposed to be produced, uh, but it's somehow left halfway? It comes with all kinds of ideas in terms of the way you, exp you experience it. In combination with, let's say, digging, excavating the floor as a negative space and having, like, using it, let's say, as an experiential, like, let's say, even pedagogical space. Um, and I've been looking at some of these old um, ships in Tema that were made and also abandoned and literally just stripping off the ribs and then uh, subverting them within this space, almost like some kind of a prehistoric animal, like for sale or something like that. So, like, how do all these architectural forms come together to be able to create a new form of imagination, literally? Um, yeah, so these are some of the things, like, research I've been doing around it, um, making drawings of thinking about, like, the topographical forms and all that and what it means in relation to, like, plants, like, the, when a plant is blooming and things like that. So this is um, last two, I promise. So this one is... We go back to the last image of the material, the scar. So this is what the sack is when I first encountered the material which drew me to itself. No one would have ever imagined that the scar, which was like the end, would have been able to produce all these thoughts that I was talking about. Because it's some kind of work which it demands some kind of subatomic thinking, like you need to go underneath the material in order to look at it very closely, then it begins to unpack all these different relations that, are, that I have spoken about in the last uh, 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> so um, through that and also collaborations with like, uh, the women in the market exchanging these, the new bags which I was talking about, uh, we are able to build these kinds of spaces and go back to the silo and do all those things that I was talking about. So the single idea, the, 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 this is where I'll leave the, the conversation, that how do we, particularly within this time that we find ourselves in, with all these contradictions that capital pro, uh, uh, possesses in the world, how do we go back to this? Like the, it's almost like the abandon, yeah, with all these policies, economic policies and everything that we've had in the world till date, it's not fundamentally changed anything through maybe, yeah, architectural forms or uh, through, let's say, ideological forms or whatever. How do we go back to like this, the idea of the ground zero, the bottom line, in order to be able to find new forms of inspiration that somehow includes everyone within the, within the conversation that the future has to offer? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.